So, you want to learn about the mass shell, huh? Alright, I'll tell you about the mass shell. First of all, what even is the mass shell? Well, the mass shell is a way of conceptualizing, in special relativity, the relationship between energy, momentum, and mass. And uh, it kind of looks like a shell. So naturally, the mass shell plays a really central role in relativistic quantum physics. And after learning about the mass shell, we'll be in a really good position to start to get into the Klein-Gordon equation. And that equation is kind of the most straightforward way to pop the mass shell into space-time. And after that, then we'll get into the Dirac equation, and we'll see a fancier way of doing that, with uh, spin and antimatter and all kinds of cool algebraic structure. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. For now, we're just going to learn about the mass shell. So let's get into it. If you want to understand the mass shell, there's three things you've got to know. Number one is if you have a relativistic particle floating through empty space, you can combine its energy and its momentum into a single vector, a four vector, called the four momentum. What this is, is the first term is the energy divided by speed of light, because if you would take energy and divide by speed, you get momentum, and so that's sort of like, what would your energy be if it were a momentum? And then the following three components of the four vector are the components of your momentum vector. And so in this way, you can see that energy corresponds to time and momentum corresponds to space. Momentum points in a particular direction. Energy just kind of is, you know? Energy is like a frequency. It's like a vibe. Momentum is like a gradient. It's like a direction. But in relativity, you combine these into the four momentum, and the four momentum encapsulates all of that energy momentum business into a single relativistic four vector. All right, so that's the first thing. Second thing is when you calculate the magnitude squared of the four momentum, you take the energy term squared and you subtract the momentum terms squared. Why do you subtract? Because normally if you have, let's say, a Euclidean four-dimensional vector, to take the magnitude squared, you would just take dot product with itself and then all the terms add, and so it's kind of weird that we have a minus sign in this situation. But that's because in relativity, we use what's called the Minkowski metric. Some people say Minkowski. Anyway, in the Minkowski metric, you have a situation where energy adds to the magnitude squared of the vector, while momentum subtracts from the magnitude squared. Oh, by the way, I'm using the mostly minus convention here. So one plus and three minuses. Some people use the mostly plus convention, and that is where energy is negative and momentum is positive. It does not matter one way or the other. Physics is exactly the same, whichever one you use. The important thing is that energy and momentum have an opposite sign relative to one another. Now, the third thing we have to know is that the magnitude of the four momentum is equal to the mass of the particle times the speed of light. And in fact, that statement can be thought of, in a sense, as the definition of mass. Well, one way of defining mass, at least. And so regardless of whatever energy or momentum the particle has, and bear in mind, a single particle from different observers' point of view might seem to have different energy and momentum, depending on how fast the different observers are moving, right? But that particle always has the same mass. By mass here, I mean rest mass. I don't use the term relativistic mass. That's not a good concept. So I always mean rest mass when I say mass. And every inertial observer is going to agree on the rest mass of the particle. And so because the rest mass times the speed of light is the magnitude of the four momentum, and the four momentum is a relativistic four vector, so it has Lorentz invariance, meaning that it doesn't matter how fast the observer's going when they look at it, they'll all agree on its magnitude. That's another way of saying that the particle's rest mass is this thing that's invariant relative to any inertial observer. Okay, so what's the idea of the mass shell? Well, the idea is this. Imagine the space of energy and momentum that any given particle might have when floating through free space. Now in that space, apply the constraint that the magnitude of the four momentum must equal the mass of the particle times the speed of light. That's going to pick out a hyperbola in the energy-momentum space, where the distance of the hyperbola's minimum from the origin is determined by the mass, and so too is kind of the radius of curvature also determined by the mass. So particles of different mass will have mass shells of different size and shape, but they'll all be on this sort of family of curves in that energy-momentum space. You know, I haven't been fully honest with you, because the curve I'm showing here has a square root. But a square root can be positive or negative, right? What's the square root of 1? It's 1, but it's also a negative 1. And so this mass shell has an evil twin. It has a negative energy twin. And actually, when you look at the mass shell, you want to look at both the positive and negative energy parts. So really, the mass shell is like two shells. Now, if you know about the Dirac equation, you've heard about these negative energy solutions. But it's actually a common misconception to attribute those to the Dirac equation per se. 
Those negative energy solutions are actually baked into the cake as far as special relativity is concerned, and the mass shell is just inherently this two-shelled situation. It's sort of like a clam, you know, you can't take one of the shells off or the thing doesn't work anymore. No, that, that, that analogy sounded better before I said it, but also it kind of works, so I'm going to keep that in there. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh yes, so we've got two shells, positive energy, negative energy, and that's because we have that square root. Now the nature of the negative energy solutions is very mysterious, and I'm not going to tell you today what they are, but when we get into the Dirac equation and we see some of its algebraic structure and we begin to interpret things like spin and antimatter, we'll see then that we can interpret it as a positive energy antiparticle. So now I'd like to switch the aesthetic of the plot to something with dots and lines connecting them, and that's going to help us visualize the mass shell in higher dimensions. What we've looked at so far is the mass shell in two dimensions, and really it's better to regard it as one plus one dimensions because of the difference in the energy versus momentum dimension as a result of the sign flip in the Minkowski metric. Anyway, if we want to extend this notion to a two-dimensional momentum space, so imagine now we're dealing with momentum in the xy plane, and then we extrude energy along the vertical axis, then the mass shell would look like this. It's sort of a web. And of course, it's not actually a discrete web like this. It's really more of a continuous shell, but I'm just showing it like a web because I think that gives us a way of looking at it and appreciating the depth and the curvature of the thing. And also, this way of plotting it is the only way I could find to even remotely do justice to the 3 plus 1 dimensional picture, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. But for now, I want to go back to the 2 plus 1 dimensional picture and highlight the symmetry of the momentum dimensions. So in this diagram, that's those horizontal dimensions. Uh, you can see that the momentum along x and y, it's exactly the same, and so we get this axial symmetry or this sort of uh, circular symmetry in those dimensions. But then along that vertical dimension, along that energy dimension, we see, of course, that there's this hyperbolic thing going on. And again, if we regard this diagram as Euclidean 3-space, then it's just a plot of a hyperboloid, and this represents a function, a relationship between the energy and the momentum. But if we regard this as a 2 plus 1 dimensional space equipped with a metric with different signs in the momentum versus the energy, then we can regard this hyperbola as a locus of points which are constant distance from the origin, where again, distance is kind of an analogy here, it's more like the, uh, the norm or the magnitude of the vector. And that's because, like we've mentioned earlier, the momentum is going to take away from the length and the energy is going to add to it. Because the 4 momentum is a 4 vector and lives in a 3 plus 1 dimensional space, I should at least try to make a 3 plus 1 dimensional plot of the mass shell. Of course, the problem with that is 3 plus 1 is 4, and when you've got 4 dimensions and you're trying to squish it all down onto a 2 dimensional screen, things get very cluttered and it's a bit confusing to parse. But despite that, there are some visually intuitive lessons we can learn from this diagram, cluttered and confusing and trippy though it may be. The first thing I'd like to highlight about this is that in 3 plus 1 dimensions, the shell is a 3 dimensional subspace of the 4 dimensional space. So let's go back for a sec to these other lower dimensional examples. In the 1 plus 1 dimensional example, the shell is a one dimensional thing, right? It's like a curve. In the 2 plus 1 dimensional example, the shell is a two dimensional thing, it's like a surface. And in the 3 plus 1 dimensional example, the shell is a three dimensional thing, it's kind of a shell like three dimensional thing in this 3 plus 1 dimensional space. And even though it's hard to see exactly what's going on in this diagram because it is so cluttered, you can actually look at the 1 plus 1 dimensional picture and just apply symmetry and realize that it doesn't matter which way the momentum is pointing in space, okay? So it's really just the norm of that momentum vector. And that's why you can kind of see that all the shapes are the same in these different numbers of dimensions. It's just the degrees of freedom and the momentum that changes. Now it's helpful to keep this picture in mind, and it'll serve you well on your adventures in relativistic quantum physics and quantum field theory because very often you're going to be integrating over a space of four momenta, and you want to select out just those values that are on shell, just those values that correspond to the real particles, that is. Well, here, let, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here, but let me just show you the equation for a general um, particle under the, uh, the Klein-Gordon equation without any potential, so just a free particle. Well, you can express that as a sum over plane waves, where you integrate over all possible four momenta, and then you slap on a Dirac delta function to select out just the four momenta that are on shell. We'll come back to this equation in the next video, and we'll talk about it in more depth. But for now, I just wanted to put this picture in your mind that it's very common to integrate over the space in which this tesseract lives, that is, the space of all four momenta, which is really like the reciprocal of space-time. 
And then I want to show you how uh, using this Dirac Delta function, which we'll also talk about in the next video, you can select the on-shell subspace of the Formamenta space. So that's just, I want to just put that picture in your mind. You don't have to know all the details of this equation right now. We will return to this later. Oh, uh, one more observation about this 3 plus 1 dimensional diagram. You can see by looking at it that it genuinely is 3 plus 1 in the sense that even though it's 4 dimensional, we still see that gradient along the energy dimension, we still see that there's the positive energy and the negative energy, uh, and you can see that the maximum of the energy is that blue hypersurface, and the minimum of the energy, that negative value, is that orange hypersurface, and then along the energy dimension we see this gradient. And again, this three-dimensional hyperboloid in the four-dimensional plot can be seen either as a function that just represents the relativistic energy-momentum mass relation, or if you equip this three-plus-one-dimensional space with the Minkowski metric, then we can regard the mass shell as a locus of points which are equidistant from the origin, and that distance is the mass of the particle times the speed of light. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned, because we've got a lot of good relativistic quantum physics coming up.